Hello. Maybe you've played it non-stop for the last 40 years, or maybe you've only ever heard the name whispered in the darkest corners of your local hobby shop. Whatever your experience with Warhammer, you've probably heard that it's the greatest story in wargaming. But what exactly happened at the begin times? I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and this is part one of the complete history of Warhammer. I've already released an overview of every edition of Warhammer Fantasy, which you can watch right here. This is part one in my deep dive into the making of those games over the last 40 years. In many ways, the history of Warhammer is the history of Games Workshop, and I'll be talking about all of the creative personnel involved in building one of the greatest war games ever made. I'm celebrating six months on YouTube and the launch of my Patreon, so I'll be releasing one video a week that looks at two different editions of Warhammer. You can join the Patreon by looking at the link in the description, and you'll get to vote on topics that I cover in future histories. But that's enough about the future, let's take a look at the past. Games Workshop was founded in 1975 by three school friends, John Peake, Steve Jackson, and Ian Livingston. The original intention was to sell the games that the three enjoyed playing and making, and they were primarily interested in a game that was just recently released in the US and which was making waves. Dungeons and Dragons. Peak left the company the following year, but Jackson and Livingston put Games Workshop onto the pathway to phenomenal success. As well as opening its first physical location on London's Dorling Road, the young GW would soon begin publishing its own magazines, books, and board games. Meanwhile in Nottingham, experienced sculptor Brian Ansell, along with Stephen Fitzwater and Paul Sully, would found Asgard Miniatures in 1976. Asgard would go on to foster the careers of notable sculptors like Jez Goodwin and Nick Bibby, but in 1978, Ansel himself left the company, entering into a partnership with Games Workshop that would change the face of tabletop gaming forever. GW would fund a new manufacturer that would exclusively handle the creation of new ranges for Games Workshop under the direction of Brian Ansel. This new company was called Citadel Miniatures. Citadel initially produced ranges both sculpted in-house and as UK manufacturer for the likes of Ral Partha, all of which were cast in metal and designed to be used in role-playing and historical war games. Ansel was eager to develop a way that would enable gamers to use all of their miniatures in one go, rather than just a few here and there like you would in a typical RPG gaming session. This was driven from a business perspective Ansel thought that the more miniatures you used in game, the more miniatures you would buy, but also from a personal one as well. Ansel was a keen war gamer. The early Planet Citadel was to develop a simple set of skirmish rules that could be written on a page or two of paper, folded up, and included for free in miniature blister packs. Ansel laid down a design mandate that D6 dice would be the only ones used. He felt that they would be the ones most common amongst the gamers who would have access to them from things like Monopoly. He was also keen that there be a role-playing element to the game, so experience could be gathered in a battle and then carried forward into future skirmishes. That hybrid approach, part war game, part role-playing game, made perfect sense on paper. Citadel and Games Workshop were already targeting role-players with ranges of D&D miniatures and the sale of things like Traveller and Call of Cthulhu and RuneQuest. But it would cause a few bumps in the road in the development of Warhammer. To develop these concepts further, Ansel brought in two games designers who had already produced their own set of fantasy skirmish rules. And Ansel must have had an eye for talent because these names would become very influential in the future of wargaming. Richard Halliwell and Rick Priestley had designed their skirmish wargame Reaper while still at school together. It was built on the foundation of Halliwell's role-playing campaign, and drew liberally on myths, legends, and existing games like D&D. Priestley and Halliwell, who was always known by his nickname Hal, really wanted to work in the emerging wargame industry. They just loved wargames, and they developed Reaper around the use of Asgard miniatures. So they thought, why not give Asgard a call and see if they would publish it? After a phone conversation with Brian Ansell, he was interested enough to invite them down to demonstrate how the game works. 
and after a successful demo game on his living room carpet, he put them in touch with Bob Connor, the owner of the Nottingham Model Soldier Shop and Tabletop Games, who produced the first and second editions of Reaper. Art for those editions was provided by Tony Ackland, another contact from Brian Ansell. Ackland was working as an illustrator and sculptor at Asgard and several of his pieces of art were used to bring Reaper to life, along with some additional art provided by Tony Yates. Though it's an important milestone in the prehistory of Warhammer, because it brought together all of the major players for the development of that game, the rules of Reaper bear only a passing resemblance to what would come later. There are some seeds in the movement, combat, magic and psychology rules that would later bear fruit, but the core mechanics for Reaper were inspired more by the likes of RuneQuest and its, at the time, pace setting percentile system. Oh, and that name Reaper? Don't fear it, apparently it owes more to the jukebox favourite by Blue Oyster Cult than anything sinister. In 1980, Ansel himself actually produced a set of miniature rules that were also published by Tabletop Games, a sci-fi skirmish game designed for 15mm miniatures that was set in a future where mankind had attained the height of technological advancement before falling once again to barbarism. That sounds familiar. Characters in the world of Laserburn could equip bolt guns, wear power armour or hang out with dreadnoughts. Now that sounds terribly familiar. So all the pieces are on the table. Brian Ansell has the will and means to create this new fantasy war game. Rick Priestley and Richard Halliwell are on hand to design it, and Tony Ackland is ready to illustrate it. Places please, Warhammer is about to begin. Over the course of 1982 and early 83, Hal focused on the development of the core rules for Warhammer, whilst Priestley was working on the magic system and the bestiary. Brian Ansell oversaw development of the whole thing, providing feedback and refinements, as well as sharing his original concepts. In the middle of 1983, it was ready to go, but it had grown way beyond that free one-page flyer that had originally been envisaged. Now, it would be a dedicated boxed release. All they needed was a name. The first one that the team settled on was Runehammer, but that was then thought to be too close to Chaosium's RuneQuest that was already sold in Games Workshop stores. Someone suggested Battleblade, but that didn't last long. And then someone else, no one remembers who, suggested Warhammer. Ansel wanted to make sure that the role-playing aspect of the game was noted up front, so the Warhammer box included the subtitle, the mass combat fantasy role-playing game. And what a box it was, featuring the epic cover art of John Blanche. The now legendary Harry the Hammer dispatches a dangerous skeleton warrior, whilst the white backgrounded box poses a striking image on the shelf. This edition would come to be known as the White Box Edition. Inside of that mighty box there were three slim black and white volumes, one each covering the core rules, magic system and the use of heroic characters. Volume 1, Tabletop Battles, explained the core rules like the turn sequence, movement, combat, psychology and how to play actual tabletop battles or dungeon fights. It also had a set of so-called creature lists which detailed the statistics for everything from men and elves to were-rats and skeletons. There was also a brief introductory battle, the Ziggurat of Doom, which would pit a party of dwarves from the wonderfully sinister Darkling Woods, a place called Dwarf Strangle, against a horde of goblins. I can't help but feel like even though the ziggurat is doomed, maybe these dwarves are even doomeder. Volume 2, Magic, explains rules for wizards and spellcasting. The wizards themselves come at four different levels of power, and there's also a higher order of arch magi. The higher the level of the wizard, the more powerful their spells. The system is built around spell selection before the game, and certain spells require certain amulets and equipment in order to use. Each time a wizard casts a spell, they use some of their constitution points, run out of CP, and you're plumb out of luck. You ain't casting nothing. Volume 3, Characters, is all about the heroes. Alongside the regular statistics that are used in the war game, this book introduces personal characteristics as well, things like social status and willpower that would be used in role-playing adventures. There are rules for character advancement through the accumulation of experience points and the subsequent progression of key stats in-game. There's even rules and advice for random encounters, character alignment, and equipment costs. The book ends with a small role-playing campaign, the Red Wake River Valley, a detailed area of this game's unknown world, full of encounters, secrets, and adversaries. 
Already in place are key mechanical concepts that will last the lifetime of Warhammer. Things like weapon skill and ballistic skill, though it's called bow skill here, as well as stuff like morale and flying creatures. Given that Citadel miniature ranges at the time were full of licensed characters and worlds like Star Trek, Doctor Who, RuneQuest, Traveller and D&D, it's perhaps no surprise that the creature lists focused on a diverse spread of fantasy humanoids and monsters. And Citadel's historical ranges provided plentiful medieval humans for use as well. There were a few surprises in these creature lists though. Night Elves and Red Goblins, Menfish and Jabberwocks, even the presumably trademark free Balrog. Whilst the seeds of modern Warhammer, or at least pre-Age of Sigmar Warhammer, are undeniably present in this game, there is a noticeable absence throughout. The known world. Because the game had been designed with the intention of letting you use all of those other Citadel ranges, there is no setting in the box. You are supposed to create your own using whatever miniatures you have. But that's not to say that the world is without character. It's almost like Priestley and Hal couldn't help but embed the kernel of something between the rules. There are playful character names throughout. Skeggy Brokenback, Saugron Brittlebone, and the evil wizard Salmon, and even the first mention of a dwarven hold by the name of Karazakarak, though the dwarves still used C's rather than K's back then. There's no real Warhammer world in this box, but it certainly doesn't feel like a lifeless void either. And that's owed in no small part to the tremendous art of Tony Ackland. His work is hugely responsible for creating a feeling of a living world, with many richly detailed and interesting pieces throughout. This tower from the Red Wake adventure is a particular favourite of mine. Every time I look at it, I see a different story emerging, as are these two pieces depicting a rat hunter versus a giant rat. Hard to know who to root for, really. Alongside the consistently terrific sales figures, there were some inconsistent reviews. Many complaints were made about the frequent typos in the text, and according to Ian Livingston, even the Games Workshop staff in London were unimpressed by the errors and the low production values. Role-playing periodical Dragon Magazine had a Warhammer feature and review in issue 85. In her feature, Catherine Kerr said that Warhammer was one of the most irritating games she'd ever read. This was not just due to the many typographical errors, however, adding, this surface sloppiness extends to the rules themselves. In that same issue's review of the game, Ken Rolston looked a little more favourably on it, describing it as, currently the most coherent blend of wargaming rules and role-playing available. And White Dwarf issue 43's independent review from Joe Diva concluded, if you have been wondering what additional fun that you could be having with your rapidly growing collection of fantasy figures, then I recommend you check out Warhammer and let battle commence. Even with the patchy reviews, the 3,000 copies that had been produced sold out rapidly. Games Workshop at the time was a very different organisation, and relied a lot on third-party products. They had recently lost the exclusive UK distribution for TSR's D&D products, and they didn't feel that they could last forever on their own board games like Talisman, or third-party role-playing games like Traveller, Call of Cthulhu and RuneQuest. They were looking for a marquee title, something that would grab customers and get them coming in again and again. And maybe Warhammer would be it. The first major expansion for Warhammer was Forces of Fantasy, a set of three additional rules booklets written by Rick Priestley and Brian Ansell that would add new rules, options and flavour to the game and its newly emerging setting. In the first volume, we are introduced to a new race, the Slam along with new rules for using battalions and larger formations. The Night Elves from the original box are gone, and in their place, the Dark Elves make their first appearance in Warhammer. The second volume covers more detailed rules for battlefields, random encounters, and using mounted troops and mercenaries. Some of these new rules and details build on material that had been released for free to subscribers and fans via the Arcane Ramblings flyers and Citadel Compendiums over the course of Warhammer's first year. Though, in some cases, those earlier releases are completely overruled or totally rewritten. The third volume of Forces of Fantasy was all about arcane magics, and it offered up a range of new magic items, monsters, spells, power weapons, and rune weapons. It even provided tables to randomly generate new magic items from scratch. Citadel had begun producing regiments of renown for Warhammer, 
These boxes of infantry units included characters and rules and lore that was bespoke to them and helped to build out the world that was becoming Warhammer. Early examples include the famous Bugman's Rangers, a unit of hardy dwarves, as well as the infamous mercenary ogres who work for Golfag. The release of the various regiments of renowned sets came with their own bits of lore that explained the origins and activities of the famous characters within, and helped to start fleshing out this largely unwritten setting. Some of the writing from these sets was incorporated into forces of fantasy, whilst some later renowned regiments would get more lore in the Citadel Compendium. There was another supplement released for first edition as well, the Book of Battalions. The book was credited to Ansel Priestley and Halliwell, but it also featured contributions from a number of other designers, artists, and players. Inside the book, you would find a collection of army lists with unit stats, battalion builds, points values, and small background sections for the actual armies that those players were using in real life. There is also an avalanche of jokes, puns, and silly names in this book. Some of them have aged badly, like Vimto Monks, some of them are still funny, like Thor Wibble, the gnome, and some are just timeless genius, like Colin, the insane necromancer. Besides all the puns, which would only continue gaining strength as Warhammer evolved, there was always a streak of British satirical humour in Warhammer as well. Former GW staffer John Stallard, who would later run Warlord Games with Rick Priestley, explained that dwarves were characterised as grim northerners, orcs were dodgy south Londoners, elves as not quite manly effete southerners. It was all just such great fun. To which Rick Priestley added that the humour was Pythonesque in places and six form in others. These were not the only influences that were important to the developing Warhammer world though. The works of J.R.R. Tolkien, Michael Moorcock, H.P. Lovecraft, Paul Anderson, Hammer Horror films even, and many, many more influences would play a key part in the world that was becoming. Rick Priestley's history degree was also a key factor, providing loads of real-world inspiration that would find its way into the old world. In its first year, the mass combat fantasy role-playing game that Brian Ansell had envisaged had come to pass. Citadel miniatures were being used by an army of gamers to play out tabletop games using the rules that Hal and Priestley had developed out of the bones of Reaper. This game was already something of a success, but there would be plenty more of that to come. In 1984, the game design oven dinged and Rick Priestley's changes to the Warhammer world would be ready. Brian Ansell had asked Priestley to start looking at a second edition of Warhammer shortly after the first one was released. He wanted him to revise and refine, to expand and evolve everything that they'd done so far, and Priestley had done exactly that. Just over a year later, the second edition of Warhammer was ready for release. Like its predecessor, this edition came in a boxed set, but this time, the mass combat fantasy role-playing game subtitle is gone, replaced by the far simpler fantasy battle rules, making a clear statement that the RPG aspects of the game are not as central as they initially were. Again, there were three books included in the box, a box which featured a dramatic new cover by John Blanche, and all three books had full colour covers, with art by either Blanche or the returning Tony Ackland. Together, the two illustrators produced some incredible work for the interiors as well, with dynamic and characterful tableaus, intriguing and fantasy-themed page furniture, and some truly stunning full-page images. Although there were still three volumes in the box, the structure of the contents was changed considerably from the first edition. Volume 1 was now called Combat, and it split the rules of play into three sections, Basic, Advanced, and Expert. The Basic rules covered everything from characteristics to moving to fighting. Advanced rules included points values, army lists, leaders, buildings, and war machines. Expert rules are limited to just the campaign system and how to give characters long-term injuries that persist between battles. The experience and role-playing elements of the first edition have been stripped back considerably here. Volume 2 covered battle magic. Much of the magic system remained the same as in the first edition, though there were some simplifications, such as removing many of the equipment restrictions required to cast spells in the first place. 
the nature of the spell lists also changed somewhat, with a more formalized structure built around different schools of magic. Now your wizard could take the flavor of necromantic magic, demonic magic, battle magic, illusionist, or elementalist magic, with specific spells for each category broken down in detail. Volume 3 was The Battle Bestiary, a book that detailed the forces that might clash in this game. First up were the men and humanoid creatures, a section that included the Amazons, Chaos Beastmen, Dark Elves, Gnomes, Hobgoblins, Chaos Warriors, and a variety of men and elves from different cultures and nations. Large humanoid creatures like giants, trolls, and tree men were then detailed, followed by undead and ethereal things. There was then a section that lumped together the animals and monsters of this new world, with rather benign creatures like giant snails sharing the page with griffins and harpies. There were also details for the elementals of this land. All of these entries included descriptions and statistics, as well as, in some cases, a little bit of background. And then there were army lists to give the whole thing some order, but that wasn't all that was in this book. At the very start, there was a map of the known world, clearly inspired by our Earth, but with some of the earliest appearances of peoples and places that would become the foundation of the Warhammer world over time. The Old World at its heart, the Chaos Wastes at its caps, Lustria, Norsica, Cathay, and even the as yet unnamed Elf Kingdoms. The true beginnings of the Warhammer world as a setting was found in these pages. Several passages of lore provided overviews of the key regions, and what's more, there was a brief timeline of key historical events. Events like the otherworldly arrival of the Slan in the earliest prehistory of the world, the incursions of Chaos and their sudden uptick, the subsequent collapse of the Slan Empire, the wars of Dwarf and Elf and Goblin, even the voyages of Eric the Lost, the Wild Norseman. All of these events, and many more besides, would later become enshrined in the history of Warhammer and expanded in subsequent editions. Warhammer 2nd Edition received more favorable reviews for its production than its predecessor, and the game itself was well received too. In issue 26 of TSR's Imagine magazine, reviewer Paul Mason noted that the second edition of the game concentrates on the wargaming rules, and concluded, all in all, Warhammer is a much improved package which covers the field of fantasy figures wargaming with simple rules and yet more comprehensively than virtually any other product. In White Dwarf number 66, reviewer Robert Alcock opened by saying, Physically, Warhammer 2 is a vast improvement upon the original, before mentioning that the development of the known world provides a useful anchorage for the wide variety of creatures and cultures. Alcock closes his review by saying that the game is a predictable expansion of the original, although it has not ironed out all the problems. However, Warhammer does remain the only viable set of fantasy mass battle rules. As with the previous edition, the first expansion that was released was an attempt to create a comprehensive set of army lists for all of the races of the Warhammer world. This time, it was called Ravening Hordes. Ravening Hordes was written by Richard Halliwell and Brian Ansell, with editing by Rick Priestley and a cover by Chris Achelios. Inside it, you'd find rules for helping players to make more complex maneuvers and for them to field more interesting characters. But the bulk of the book was dedicated to army, ally, and mercenary lists for everything from orcs and goblins to the Empire to the undead. It still featured a few forces that were not long for the Warhammer world, at least as former units or armies with Nippon receiving their own army entry, Zotes had their own rules, and even ghosts that carried blunderbusses. This was also the first time since they were released in the Citadel Journal that the Skaven would be included as an army in a core Warhammer product. We hit the big time, boys. Warhammer 2nd Edition's starter box had also included a scenario written by Richard Halliwell called The Magnificent Sven, which saw drunken dwarf Sven Hasselfressian lead a crew of dwarves and Norsemen into battle against a group of renegade slam, led by Gurgle Greenwake. The scenario reads like it's part novel, part role-playing adventure, and then a small part war game, so it's still very clearly in that liminal space between RPG and miniatures game. It does include rules for just two players, one leading Sven's forces and one leading Gurgles, but it's clearly built around the involvement of a third party who could act as GM, and that is a format that the subsequent scenario packs for 2nd edition would all follow. The first scenario pack was Bloodbath at Orcs Drift, 
written by Ian Page, Gary Chalk, and Joe Diva. This pack would take place in a new region of the Warhammer world, one that wouldn't survive into later editions. Romalia. It was described as a place full of colonies established by men, elves, and dwarves. Colonies that would come under threat from a huge orc invasion. There's obviously some questionable material in this one, despite the inventive pun, but there's also some fun stuff as well. Like most of the later scenario packs, Orcs Rift included a mini campaign booklet, a map, cardboard cutouts for miniatures you didn't have, cardboard buildings, and a spiffy little badge. The second pack was called Blood on the Streets, and it was written by Andrew Skipankiewicz. It was something of an anomaly because it didn't include a mini campaign. Instead, this was essentially a roleplay supplement providing details on a region in the Warhammer world called the Riding. There was information about the people who lived there, the villages, and the surrounding areas. It also had a fair few cardboard buildings in it, and was subtitled Village Pack 1. Terror of the Lichmaster, subtitled Village Pack 2, was written by Rick Priestley, and this was the next scenario to be released, which would add even more texture to the Warhammer world. It was particularly impactful as it introduced the long-running Warhammer villains Krell and his boss, the Lichmaster Heinrich Kemmler, as well as the flaming schooled zombie Mikhail Jackson. Shaman. Terror of the Lichmaster follows Kemmler as he plagues the Frugalhorn Valley, a remote and lawless land that would arguably become known as the Border Princes in later editions. Kemmler has fallen on hard times, but having found the burial mound of a legendary Chaos Warrior by the name of Krell and resurrected this formidable champion, he is intent on reclaiming his former position of direful glory. The fourth and final pack was Tragedy of McDeath. Drawing on aspects of Macbeth, then contemporary British politics, Scottish legend, and a barrage of questionable puns and jokes, this tale was set on the Isles of Albion. Like the other mini campaigns, there were a range of miniatures released by Citadel to represent the characters from the scenarios, including the monster of Loch Lorm, Arca Zargul, and the Knight of Harkness. It seems that there was to be another scenario pack that never got designed or released. In Terror of the Lichmaster, there is a small description that reads, From Ian Page, the co-author of Orcs Drift, comes this spirited piece of plagiarism. Maritime mayhem in search of a lost treasure unites an unlikely crew off the coasts of Lustria, whilst the Third Citadel Journal included this note. Work is already underway on another scenario pack, Hell's Bells and Buckets of Blood. This one is set to be on the high seas, featuring model galleons, pirates, plotters, Captain Crook, and the crew of the Ents Surprise. <laughs> okay, I do quite like those puns. Over the three years following its release, second edition Warhammer would sell like hot doomstones. White Dwarf would continue to support it with scenarios, features, adverts, and reviews, arguably even more so after Brian Ansell took over Games Workshop in 1985. Ansell, as managing director, would push Games Workshop even more into the worlds of Warhammer and the soon-to-be Warhammer 40,000. He was keen to continue expanding the Citadel miniatures range in ways that had never before been imagined. As Ansel, Hal, and Priestley had refined the rules for the game, the art and miniatures had developed in extraordinary fashion as well. Uniquely Warhammerian concepts and designs, perhaps influenced by external sources, but distilled into something bespoke and new, would give rise to the ranges of Citadel miniatures for Chaos, the Skaven, Orcs and Goblins, High Elves, Dark Elves, Wood Elves, and of course, the Forces of Empire and the Dwarves. John Blanche is credited by Brian Ansell with providing sculptors like Alan and Michael Perry with specific illustrations of how certain miniatures were to look. Blanche was already influential in the early editions of Warhammer, but for me, and I suspect many others, his art and art direction would come to define the world and denizens of Warhammer to an enormous degree. Along with Blanche, Tony Ackland, Tony Yates, Chris Akelios, and the Perry brothers, there were an army of incredibly talented artists and sculptors to whom the world of Warhammer, its character, its look, its success, is all very rightly owed. Ian Miller, Trish and Ali Morrison, Jez Goodwin, Bob Naismith, Nick Bibby, and Kevin Adams, as well as many others, were all fundamental to the development of early Warhammer. With two editions of Warhammer Fantasy under its belt, Games Workshop would very soon look to the stars. But first, it would look to the gutters. In 1986, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay was released. 
Wolfrop, first edition, would inform the development of the next iteration of Warhammer, and it would help to expand, document, and formalize the known world in a way that hadn't been yet seen, bringing together all of those disparate pieces of world building that had so far happened in books, boxes, flyers, and magazine articles. But more discussion on that game is definitely for another time. Richard Halliwell, HAL, was monumentally important in the creation of Warhammer and the development of Games Workshop as a result. It's hard to overstate just how integral his contributions were. He would stay involved in the development of Warhammer with the third edition, which we'll talk about next time, and he'd go on to create games like Space Hulk and Dark Future. He was a keen traveller, and he spent much of his time with Games Workshop as a freelancer. Then in the early 90s, he decided to leave the company for good. He also, for a time, took a step back from games design as well. In May 2021, Richard Halliwell passed away. I never met him in real life, but I do wonder if perhaps I've met just a fraction of his spirit on all of those battlefields and tabletops of Warhammer over the years. I feel like I owe him an enormous debt. His incredible innovation, his phenomenal passion, his wondrous work has left a lasting legacy. And I imagine that many other wargamers feel the same. I really hope that you've enjoyed joining me for this deep dive into the first couple of editions of Warhammer Fantasy. If you did, feel free to leave a like, a comment, and to subscribe to the channel. And of course, check back next week when part two will be looking at the third and fourth editions of the game. You can also support the channel and help me grow by joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash jordansorcery where you'll also be able to vote on the topics for future videos. I just want to thank everybody who has watched the channel and joined the channel and joined the Patreon so far. I am really, really grateful for all of your support. I absolutely love making these videos, so I really want to find a way to keep doing it. So thank you very, very much for everything you've done. Thank you very much for watching. I am Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. First edition, second edition, third edition, four. Then Rick Priestley will write one more. Sixth edition, seventh edition, try to mend. But the eighth will be the end. Oh.